Hello. Welcome to the Anvil Media webinar, Lunch and Learn webinar, leveraging virtual events to <laughs> this thing is sort of engage customers and prospects. Hi, I'm Kent Lewis, president and founder of Anvil Media, and with me is Joanna Hammond, account coordinator at Anvil. Go ahead and say hi, Joanna. Hello, everyone. Yeah, you're supposed to say, say hi, Joanna. It's hi, Joanna. A, it's always a very funny joke. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah, so virtual events, uh, an interesting concept, uh, timely post-COVID, and we'll get into it in a second. Uh, for those of you, I, I didn't put, Joanna, your social on here, but you can shout out if you want. I want to protect your privacy, but I'm, I'm very public. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at Kent J. Lewis. Uh, Google me on the LinkedIn or linked me, LinkedIn on me on the Google and uh, follow me or connect with me there. And you can follow us on every social platform at Anvil Media. And hopefully we will see you out on the social graph. Joanna, do you want to say anything about your contact info or you want to keep it, keep it, uh, keep it close to the vest? Well, I mean, I am running the Anvil social, so you could always contact me on there. So I'm good with the at Anvil Media. Perfect. Thank you very much. All right. Well, let's get uh, started on this leveraging virtual events to engage customers and prospects. A, a little bit of background about us. I'll let Joanna tell a bit more about her background. Uh, I started in digital 96, I've been a part of nine agencies. After getting fired um, a second time, I decided I better not uh, do, I better do my own thing and not work for anybody else. So I've been doing Anvil for over 20 years, uh, digital marketing agency. I've also been an adjunct since 2000 at Portland State. I teach a search marketing workshop, which is where I met Joanna. And uh, we also host a uh, online career community. It's a LinkedIn group called PDX Mindshare, also on the on the web at pdxmindshare.com. And we have webinars and podcasts and other educational uh, information for career-oriented individuals. Uh, if you want to learn more about digital marketing, it's tangential to this conversation, but very much in our day-to-day, -day, scmpdx.org is a great resource with free and low-cost events, a great newsletter and other resources, great blog. Uh, you can also find our writing at Smart Brief, uh, Gator News and other uh, places where Joanna and I have written. And if you want to learn more about social media specifically, I teach a workshop quarterly for SCORE in Portland. Of course, it's virtual, so you can be anywhere in the world. Uh, anything you want to add to that, Joanna, before we get going? Yeah, just that I am the account coordinator here at Anvil, and I have a background in both content and social. And like Kent mentioned, I took his SEM workshop at PSU, and that's kind of what brought me to Anvil. So that's excited to be here. Fantastic. Thank you, Joanna. So uh, what we're going to cover today, we're going to talk about why virtual events matter as opposed to physical real world events, uh, various uh, event formats and platform options, a few best practices, how to measure the success of a virtual event, a few key takeaways, a few resources, and then we'll end with uh, some Q&A. So, so with that said, I'm going to hand it over to Joanna to, uh, to uh, kick things off. Awesome. So as we will learn, there are many benefits to hosting a virtual event as opposed to their in-person counterparts. Not only are virtual events cost effective, as 84% of organizations who have run virtual events report that they spent less on their virtual events than their in-person ones. But virtual events also save time for everyone involved. Uh, people are able to attend virtual events from anywhere in the world um, at their own convenience, giving people control over their own calendars. Also, virtual events eliminate the need to have travel time to the event or set up time for the event or any other time intensive aspects of event planning. So they really do save a lot of time in the long run. Uh, virtual events also scale very easily and affordably. Since there's really no limit to the amount of people who can attend your event, they can be as small or large as you want uh, for a relatively similar price. Also virtual events allow for global reach People can attend your event from all over the world, and you are going to be able to connect with people who you otherwise could not be able to connect with in person. Um, since virtual events um, can be recorded, they can also be easily archived and shared across social, which is something that in-person events do not uh, have the opportunity to do. Virtual events can also be thoroughly and easily measured. Uh, metrics such as engagement or attendance can easily be accessed 
um, on webinar platforms and easily uh, analyzed. Uh, lastly, virtual events create the opportunity to optimize your content marketing strategy as snippets or little videos from the event can be shared across social and used for content. Did you want to call out that stat at the bottom? Oh, I did already mention that, but yeah, okay. 84, okay. Yeah, we're all good then, sorry. Okay. So not only are virtual events convenient, but they're also very effective in attracting attendees, um, as well as achieving major marketing goals, such as converting leads or um, optimizing brand awareness. Um, in fact, uh, let me look at this graph really quick. So of um, about 50% or more of people who have had, um, who have put on virtual events, say that they were able to attract the same or more um, attendees as they were for in-person events. Um, also 79% of marketers are currently running webinars, 84% of whom have increased frequency in the last year or so due to COVID. By September 2020, 34% of marketers made virtual events a part of their core marketing strategy. Lastly, 55% of marketers who have run virtual events felt that these events exceeded their expectations. Oops. So let's get into some virtual events. Fun fact, virtual events are successful in generating sales. About eight in 10 um, marketers surveyed believe that webinars are an effective channel to create a sales pipeline. Also 82% of B2B marketers believe that attendee engagement is an important KPI to measure event success with about two thirds, however, about two thirds or two thirds of them um, consider this strong engagement to be a challenge to achieve. So we will go over some ways to maximize engagement later on in this webinar. As for measuring success of a webinar, 23% of respondents consider lead quality a primary measurement of success, while others focus on pipeline conversion and lead volume as their priorities. Lastly, participation in virtual events can take a lot of forms. Um, in 2020, 64% of marketers hosted their own virtual events, while 42% 40, hosted online meetups and 39% sponsored a virtual event. So participating in a virtual event doesn't mean you have to actually host your own. You could always sponsor one. Mm -hmm. Some more fun facts. According to Wild Apricot, the number of organizations who are planning on running virtual events doubled in 2020. Taking a look at the graph on the right um, of organizations who had never run a virtual event prior to 2020, the majority of them only planned on hosting one virtual event in 2020. However, of organizations who have run virtual events in the past and have seen how successful they can be, the majority of them planned on hosting 11 to 15 virtual events in 2020. Um, as for how long attendees are willing to watch a virtual event, in 2020, attendees watched on average 61% of a 60 minute session. So that's about 35 minutes. And the average virtual attendee only watches about 68% of a virtual session that is 20 minutes or longer. So shorter events can have higher engagement. Lastly, the overwhelming majority, about 80% of event planners report that attendee engagement and satisfaction are major KPIs used to determine virtual event success. And it looks like in terms of virtual events, the, you know, planning to run back a year ago, it was the sweet spot was one. And then a little, a, a few more folks were doing four to six, but um, I'm guessing this year, that's been a massive shift to a lot more events permanently. Is that, is that what you're seeing, Joanna? I agree, definitely. Okay. So no event is free of challenges, including virtual events. So some major challenges to consider when it comes to running virtual events include uh, the fact that there are so many other virtual events happening these days and participants are getting sick of these online calls. Another major challenge is that supporters may not be technologically savvy enough 
to learn how to operate these new platforms and other technologies. Um, another major challenge is that it's getting hard to generate participation in these uh, virtual events, as well as the concern that these virtual events may not um, generate any revenue. Um, other concerns include um, not being able to deliver the kind of value that members need from virtual events in a virtual environment. Um, there's also a concern that supporters may not have stable internet or that the organization may not have the technological infrastructure to run these events properly. Okay. So some more stats about virtual event challenges. According to a recent survey, 34% of marketers cited a lack of time dedicated to planning and presenting virtual events as a major challenge. 27% uh, cited content creation challenges and 22% indicated virtual events were perceived as an ineffective marketing strategy. Lastly, 23% reported that they had never even thought about running webinars as a marketing tool. Hmm. Other issues to consider are that maybe virtual events may not be the right fit for your target audience. For example, if your target audience is not very tech savvy or comfortable with new technologies, it may not be a great fit to have a webinar in place where the audience would have to learn these new technologies. Other issues include not having available technology resources or budget to plan and present these events. And lastly, not being able to generate enough interest in the event through marketing and email. Some top objectives when considering your virtual event are keeping members connected to your brand, um, trying to maintain normal programming throughout COVID, attracting new members to your organization, raising brand awareness, and raising money. Now, keep in mind, this survey was of trade organizations that are member-based and revenue-based uh, based on, on those that membership. So... Um, other brands might have other objectives, but I thought I think this one's this is helpful guidance for any organization has a, has members. Even even you could consider employees as well. Uh, so I thought that that was interesting, but it definitely it it definitely is um, from a one industry or organization perspective. So of organizations who have found success running virtual events. Um, the top objectives that they reported were keeping members connected, trying to maintain normal programming throughout COVID, and attracting new members to their brand. Right. And what's interesting about this is they've also had a 91% failure rate at uh, keeping members connected. So it's the most effective and least effective. Right. Uh, and then everything else was largely ineffective in the other category. So. Um, kind of interesting to see that the numbers were not opposite. They were all similarly challenging. So let's talk a little bit about planning your virtual and hybrid event. So there are a couple of questions you need to ask yourself as you're going through the planning process. Uh, should there be different registration uh, registrations or tickets for attendees versus sponsors and speakers? Are you going to offer any paid or free tickets? Is your event a one day, multi-day, a week long? I've seen in my experience, some events that typically were one day have stretched to multiple days and conversely the other way, because my experience as a, as a speaker and an instructor teacher type is that I, I speak or teach at twice the speed online as I do in person. So I think you can get a lot more done in a day virtually than you ever could physically without the people moving around and changing rooms and, um, you know, going on smoke breaks and so forth. Um, are you going to have sessions or workshops, you know, learning type events at your, at your uh, event, at, at your virtual event? Is the content going to be available on demand post event? Are you going to serve meals? Uh, that would be at your hybrid event. I think serving meals at a virtual event sounds goofy, but you could actually buy Grubhub, DoorDash, or Uber Eats certificates and send them to your attendees for that bonus point. A um, little nice touch of class, expensive, uh, but it, you know, for a smaller intimate group, it could be impressive. 
Uh, do you need a, an attendee's home address to send swag boxes or you're not going to send physical items? I think adding a physical component because you don't, I'm addicted to swag at conferences and, and virtual events have definitely killed that vibe. So I think it's important to think about if that makes sense, especially for sponsors to get in front of, uh, of the attendees. Are you going to need attendees clothing sizes for those swa that swag as well as the address? And then are you going to need captions or real-time translation for your event? I think if you've got any focus on healthcare or I don't know, maybe legal or others where um, there's an ADA component to it, that it's your audience or end users, I think that's really, really important. So those are factors to consider. Uh, there are a variety of different formats as well, as well. According to research, you've got your standard member meetings, uh, which is uh, primarily has been in, for, in person, but it's definitely grown. Uh, I mean, it's definitely a, a component uh, has a huge virtual component, but at a decreasing, it's a it's a it's a bit less. Versus webinars are obviously primarily vir um, virtual versus in person, so that's a, a bigger different uh, differential. Uh, and then big uh, galas, big events, obviously are primarily in person. So almost everything else is pretty close. Panel discussions, guest speakers, happy hours. Uh, happy hours are not quite the same virtually, although we do them weekly at Anvil with uh, some success for sure. By format and type, you've got the, uh, the regular occurrence of virtual events in the future. So basically the answer is more in the future. The majority are gonna do global virtual events with live feeds from headliner speakers. And I've seen a few of these in the last 12 months, some better than others. So, you know, always a share or a possibility of glitches. Um, some presenters do really well virtually, many do not. So that's a consideration. Um, are you looking to foster community and share thought leadership? Or is it more of a, of a techno gizmo salesy sort of approach? Uh, and then there's kind of that virtual gatherings by gatherings by country or region. Uh, that's that's a thing, members only. So there are a lot of different uh, re regular recurring virtual event formats. Now, addition, going deeper into the options, you have to consider what works best for certain elements, like the size of the event, where virtual uh, webinar or hybrid are the different options. So you have to keep that in mind. And uh, I'm just gonna, yeah, oh, sorry, video means. So virtual webinars and video meetings. And video meetings are not great for almost anything, although the video conferencing co companies would like to believe otherwise, like you to believe otherwise. Uh, webinars are great for large events. They're great for some level of interactivity, a little bit of chat, moderated QA, polls, et cetera. And then the cost is, is, uh, is a good value. Um, but virtual events have more elements to them, a little more robust functionality, and it does all of these things well, according to somebody I'm guessing in the business that framed up these checkboxes to be um, very relevant uh, to their selling the virtual events. So mostly what we see is live and asynchronous or recorded. Um, I've done a few hybrid events where I've recorded a session in advance, and then I um, am asked to wear the same shirt to do the live Q&A. And that's a bummer when you left your, your shirt um, an hour and a half away um, at a vacation getaway. So you have to drive back and get the shirt. So I have done that at least once. I won't say any more than that. Uh, live streaming video, that's definitely growing on all the social platforms. Every single social platform has some component. And then with Clubhouse, that's that social audio approach. Virtual events where you have very fancy um, platforms like NX Pro, VFair, Six Connects, Hexafair, and others. And then hybrid. Um, so that real world plus live plus pre-recorded plus virtual plus some maybe even live or virtual networking there are different tools and platforms for that it gets interesting and live streaming so thinking about that specifically there's uh, various options now periscope i don't believe is as much of a thing anymore but you got facebook live uh, youtube instagram a lot of options there uh, but it's a way to broadcast live you basically create a temporary tv channel and you can piggyback and utilize multiple platforms, multiple streams, um, even Twitch, if you're into the gaming world, is a thing. Uh, the emerging platforms for streaming would be definitely TikTok and Snapchat and Cl uh, Clubhouse for audio. Um, and then LinkedIn. <laughs> Sorry, I'm allergic to, to Clubhouse. I really dislike them. 
for delaying their uh, Android platform. Anyway, support. Um, go to your audience, build a following, and then test, but commit to a long-term. I think that's the greatest success is when brands are saying, we're going to give six to 12 months to this, not just one event. If it doesn't work once, that didn't work at all. That's not what it's about. So impact, again, there are different things to consider. So um, standard member meetings do really well um, on virtual events. There, there's um, some arguably high success there, but guest speakers are perhaps the best because you don't have to pay for travel to get a world-class speaker. And uh, webinars, of course, uh, panels can work actually quite well. Uh, people joining in from around the world. I was just on a session for two hours this morning with people from all, literally all over the world. One of the guys that I meet with regularly is in Croatia. And, um, and you know, nighttime for him, morning for me, always interesting to get that global perspective, something you wouldn't in a physical event typically. Um, so on the webinar side, there are a variety of tools here and you can see, um, interesting, I'd never heard of Webinar Jam, the least used, so probably not a surprise, but um, you've got GoToWebinar. Um, Demio, I have not used. Uh, Crowdcast, I am familiar with and use, have used once, a, once or twice. We've all used Zoom. Some of us bought the stock too late to matter. And then uh, I didn't even realize Vimeo had a, a webinar component. Um, so Zoom webinars, Zoom meetings, right, are the, are the big ones, and then GoToWebinar. Um, so, you know, the idea is to figure out which platform is right for you. Um, and each one has a slightly different focus in terms of functionality and benefit, but this is a list you can go do your own research and come up with your own conclusion on what, what a good webinar platform is for you. So uh, best practice data integration. This is a, just a reminder that it's absolutely important to tie all your data together. You know, so who are the other teams that need to be a part of the event and the activities are using event management platform? Uh, what technology might you need? Um, is your organization doing, what are they doing to capture customer information, prospect data? So you get people to the event, then what? And where are the information gaps? So you've got your event technology. Do you need other uh, business platforms to connect or to bring in to fill gaps? Uh, event data, how are you gonna share that across your organization? Basically, you know, in our world, Joanna and I might say the word MarTech or marketing technology stack. But in, in reality, what we're, you know, there's, there are even subdivisions like marketing automation, or in this case, event technology. There may be multiple vendors and tools you need just to throw one particular event. And how do different event management platforms integrations work? How do they all work together? Um, it's, it's all about figuring out. So bringing your IT team in is basically very, very important unless you're a seasoned veteran at uh, virtual and digital and hybrid events. Structure is a factor. So picking the right time and date is important. So noon on Wednesdays is optimal according to research, although that may change. I would say Friday at four, unless it's happy hour, is not a great time for a professional event. Uh, the presenter or presenters, what is their style, their level of experience, not just in their industry, but in presenting and particularly in, in digital. So I've been presenting digitally for many years, but others I found still struggle with different platforms functionality, right? So that's important. And you need to prepare those that are not as tech savvy on how to use these tools. And I think that's important whether if you're the event uh, manager. Length, um, you know, I typically am used to speaking for 50 to 60 minutes, uh, but as Joanna pointed out earlier, 20 to 40 minutes is really the sweet spot where you start really losing people. So we're gonna try and keep ours to, you know, 30, 35 minutes. Um, format, you can do fully virtual. So webinars, live streaming, you can go hybrid. Um, you know, you've got a physical event and then you stream things in, uh, in and stream speakers out that are live. Uh, I think that's kind of where the future is now that we've been post COVID. Um, you might, you know, how many panels versus presenters, educational versus collaborative discussion. Um, and then, you know, how are you going to handle all the different platforms for registration, Q and A, chat, polling, recording, um, transcription, et cetera. Um, and even just uh, managing the, the, the presentations themselves download later. Right. So there's a big step and we're at step one, right? A lot to consider as you build out your plan. So then you've got um, some best practices and event content. And that includes your landing pages for your promotion of your event. You know, an abstract, some images, some samples, photos, sample videos from the past, 
or teaser videos for the future if you don't have historic information or content or assets. Uh, multimedia is king. Google loves it. So do humans. Video, audio, images, not just text. Oh, sorry, this thing stops. Um, segments and uh, segments and transitions, having breaks, having nice smooth transitions. Um, do you have audio like music in between? Do you have entertainment or some sort of MC? Um, how much polling or Q&A sessions are you going to do? So with the session I'm doing in a couple of weeks, uh, they asked if I was doing any polling. I find that it's helpful, but I don't do it enough. Q&A, they said, do you want to do it real time or at the end? Typically, I, you know, the default is at the end, but if it's a great question and it, and it doesn't look like I'm going to answer it in the flow, I, I prefer real time questions. <clears throat> Breakout rooms is a unique benefit, I believe, that doesn't really work in the physical world where you can have a main presenter on a topic and then instantly put people in breakout sessions from, you know, all over the world versus at that turn to the people at your table and talk for three minutes. That works, but I think the ability to control where people, who connects, it's unless you're assigned seating at tables and the tables are round, it's really hard to get people to break out. So that's a great functionality. And then, you know, the bio breaks, even if it's virtual, people still have to go to the bathroom. So uh, just make sure that your audio is off, right? And your video too. Uh, real-time playback, uh, sorry, real-time feedback is important. Uh, being able to adjust to the suggestions in real time is important. And then following up. So uh, messaging, you know, yes, these slides will be available. The most common question be, uh, besides the statement you're on mute. And then real-time surveys or surveys immediately after the event while it's fresh is really important. So uh, a couple of best practices, and I'll hand it back over to Joanna. Um, these are things I've written a whole article about, but a good microphone. So I'm using the, uh, the Shure SM7B. It's, uh, it's, not that, it's not that cheap, but it is one of the best. And I uh, have a, a radio um, on-air talent guy that set me up with uh, my setup um, that right now I'm using. A, um, a cloud uh, adapter for volume, a Scarletti, no, a Scarlet um, mixer. Um, I, I don't even know this technology. He just said, here's the best stuff, do it. So I have a great mic. It has better resonance and less um, background noise than a, than a standard like earbud headset, um, a camera. So usually you use your webcam, but make sure you have a good, uh, good camera. Um, but more importantly than that is the lighting. So I'm using both natural light and the light from my screen to make sure that I'm getting uh, the right amount of balance. I'm not one side of my face is lit and I'm not back lit by the window. Um, you know, do you have a background? Like, so the, unfortunately my background here changes, but I don't want you to see the office I share with my my young son because it's, uh, it's just distracting. A lot of Legos behind me. Um, and then dress code, I'm wearing the branded gear um, and, and I'm wearing shorts, but you don't know that. Maybe I'm wearing slacks, who's to say? Uh, framing. So am I huge in the photo or am I tiny? Am I far away? That matters. Uh, you don't want to be looking up my nose and you don't want to be looking down uh, at my bald spot. So uh, posture is key. I'm leaning forward. Uh, maybe I should be sitting up straight. It apparently gives you more strength, but I got to stay close to the mic. Use lots of gestures and so forth and such. That's important. And then eye contact. I can see you. So remember to look into the webcam when you're presenting. So with that said, now you're ready for uh, a few nuggets from Joanna. Awesome. So as I mentioned before, engagement is a very important KPI when measuring the success of a virtual event. Some ways that you can engage your attendees throughout your virtual event include opening up a discussion to all of the attendees, um, holding a question and answer session, holding a survey or poll, hosting a live hangout before or after the event, or even hosting some interactive activities such as games or even contests and giveaways. Before deciding which type of engagement method you are hoping to use for your virtual event, it's important to first understand attendee motivators and expectations for the event. For example, if attendees are hoping to ask direct questions to the speaker during the event, then maybe a Q&A session would be the most effective um, type of engagement method. Um, or for example, if attendees are hoping to use the event to network with each other, then maybe hosting a live event before or after the event or a live hangout 
um, would be most effective. So maybe a happy hour or a meet and greet would be an effective way for them to achieve those goals. Um, it's also very important to ask questions and allow the opportunity for attendees to ask questions of you. So this doesn't have to be through a Q&A session. This could be more interactive using polls and surveys, um, allowing attendees to kind of have an activity and be able to do something throughout the event. Um, there's also the distinction between large open discussions um, with the whole entire group or smaller um, opportunities for connection with breakout rooms. So you have to decide that ahead of time, whether you'd like the discussions to be very large and open or smaller and more connected. Um, there's also a distinction between engagement in live events versus pre-recorded events. So um, engagement in live events could look like attendees asking questions um, in real time in the comment section of a live stream, whereas engagement for a pre-recorded event could look like comments on a YouTube video or even sending out a survey 24 hours after the event has been posted online. Engagement could also be fun, like interactive breaks. So these could be mindfulness activities, such as breathing exercises, or it could even be games. There's also opportunities for contests, giveaways, and promotions, uh, which would be a great opportunity to utilize user-generated content. Uh, for example, you could encourage that attendees submit photos of their pets, for example, um, in order to be entered to win a prize. Uh, people are very prize motivated, so contests, giveaways, and promotions would be a great way to generate interest and engagement. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, did you? Sorry. There you go. Of course. Um, so some ways to attract uh, members to your virtual event include promoting the event over email, posting about the event on social and promoting it on your website as well. Um, other ways to promote your event include paid ads on social, posting in your member forum, or even through direct mail. Lastly, social media is a crucial tool in both promoting the event and encouraging engagement during and after the event. So 89% of event planners use social media to promote the event before the event. So this could look like uh, posting a poll on social media where attendees can vote for topics of interest that they'd like to discuss during the event. 49% uh, take advantage of social media during the event. So this could look like using social media to ask questions of the speaker during real time. And lastly, 38% use social media uh, for feedback after the event. So this could look like posting a survey on LinkedIn, for example, where attendees could uh, use the poll to give you some feedback on how you did at your event. Thank you so much, uh, Joanna. So we are um, gonna wrap it up here with uh, some three Ps of event preparation. This is from a previous presentation I gave to event planners um, that was relatively well received. And I just think it's good for those of you that are newer in the event world, just some key reminders from some of the experts. So um, there are three Ps I think of a of successful event preparation. That's um, which pla uh, planning on which platforms you will be using, particularly for virtual events. What's the, con con the content and the format and frequency? Uh, you've got to create, if you're going to do social, you've got to create social profiles. The big six platforms listed below are a great place to start. Uh, you might find if it's a younger audience, TikTok might, TikTok might be more relevant um, for an older audience, I guess, Facebook. Um, preliminary promotion includes, you know, what kind of deals for registration discounts and um, using hashtags or developing a following. And so the other people, this is one of my biggest gripes with events that I'm a part of. <clears throat> as a speaker, attendee, sponsor, is that there's no hashtag for the event. So it's not easy to find information about the event um, in social feeds, particularly when it's real time happening. So establish a hashtag in front of the event ahead of time and let everybody know, especially speakers and sponsors, so they can start building momentum and awareness for it. And then you can do a lot of better tracking and identification of, of trends and so forth. 
Um, teaser videos and blog interviews are really effective. Um, uh, uh, requesting speakers to have long form articles to um, you know augment their content. So in, for instance, I have a, we have an article that um, Joanna did the heavy lifting on on this very topic. That's a great follow on for those that don't listen well and just prefer to read. Um, so the example I have here is uh, two posts from the Global Student Entrepreneur Awards. I was involved in the Portland chapter competition uh, two years ago, and they did a great job of using hashtags, links, at sign, you know, profiles, etc. They've done a good job with that, messaging and referencing their other platforms, great videos and and imagery. They're doing it right. And then there's the three C's of event communication. So when you're actually both pre and during, and as well as a little bit of post is creating, you know, build a content